All right, so hello and welcome. So today we're talking about knights in D&D. &D. And we will go over their stat blocks. So we're going to go over the history of knights. And we're going to go over basically everything you need to know about knights. And basically how to fix them. <clears throat> but first, we don't have a sponsor today. Because this video is going to be entirely sponsored by myself. And you will see why as we go through this. So, knights in D&D, &D, okay? This is the actual stat block if you look up a knight in D&D, &D, okay? Here's the problem with it. It just sucks ass. So the knight has very good armor at plate for a CR3 creature, which means its proficiency bonus is two. It's only proficient in wisdom and constitution saving throws. It has 16 strength, which is not very good, and two weapon attacks, and that's it. And it has some special abilities. Um, and it even tells you that uh, knights have pledged service to rulers, religious orders, and noble causes, okay? But here's the problem with this whole thing right here, okay? It's just wrong. So, they're thinking that knights are a CR3 creature. Whatever you think about the CR system, it usually works from CR3 to 8, okay? The problem is knights are trained killers since birth, okay? Um, and they're only CR3 creatures. We're going to change that to make them better. And actually how if you fought a knight 1v1... It's not going to go very well for you if you were not a very experienced. Um, and even very experienced people would lose to knights, okay? Knights are very dangerous when you, when they're armored and they know what the hell they're doing. Because it's basically the majority of what their life is, is combat, okay? So, we're going to change this stat block from a CR3 into something that actually makes sense. But first, we need to go over the history of knights, okay? So, this is the chronological history in our timeline of knights. First, they're a page. Page, um, zero to seven. There's no real term for this um, age group, group, but seven years old you become a page. Okay, so the mother would do most, if not all, of the part of basically raising this page or noble person. Um, they would teach them basic manners, communications, how to dress themselves. They also taught them sewing, tailoring devices, name it, whatever their mother taught them. This is very important and key fact that their mother was actually very important in their uh, development. Um, and their mother taught basically everything from zero to seven, okay? Father didn't really do much. Not to say that they couldn't, it's just they didn't usually, historically. Um, so, now page part two. So, the actual, what their term is, was page. They were born a noble. At age seven, they were sent to another noble family to train. As, us as usually, in theory, they would be treated less well, okay? They would learn how to read and write, sometimes learn etiquette and behavior. Again, this is very general, okay? But just know that these people were noble birth, had a lot of money, and they usually were sent to a different family so that they could learn and be trained, okay? And they wouldn't be treated as nicely, okay? Because they weren't of that house, okay? At least that was the idea. And of course, you could do whatever you want, right? Um, some knights even didn't follow this, but again, it's just generally. Next is the squire, okay? This is an important bit. So age 14 to 21, okay? This is basically their fundamental training and all the way up to when they become a knight, okay? Just before they become a knight. They were trained in combat, okay? Trained how to ride a horse, trained how to use a lance. They worked out a lot. They trained in armor. They learned languages, okay? German knights sometimes learn English languages um, and would continue to read and write, okay? They'd practice. They would learn how to manage an estate. They could also go into battle as a knight's assistant, okay? They could go put his armor on for him, do all of that, okay? They could also fight, technically, um, if you needed a second person to fight in, in the knight's retinue, which we'll get to, okay? Um, and they served at his squire until they were knighted at whatever point. Um, usually, earliest, 2021, okay? And again, these are all men. I, I don't think I need to spell that out, but these are all men in our, in our own timeline, okay? But that's generally what a squire did. Basically, they're a knight in training, and they could assist their knight in a variety of ways, the person they were actually learning from, um, and basically be his assistant, okay? Now, let's talk about a knight. At the earliest, they would be 20 to 21 in our timeline, okay? They were knighted at a ceremony called the accolade, okay? It's basically a special ceremony where they're told, hey, this is the code, this is what you're supposed to do, don't do anything stupid, you're going to be loyal to me, you know, there's shebang, you can do whatever you want. Um, there is some historical records which we'll go through later, 
like the night like the code of chivalry and a whole bunch of other stuff that you can incorporate that we did in our own timeline but you can do whatever you want in D&D but just know that technically there should be a ceremony of some kind they would swear fealty to their lord and usually they were given a title sir or sir okay that's where the title sir comes from so sir you know uh, hunter um that's where this title comes from it is an actual local title technically um they had a retinue of experienced fighters that they took on campaign with them okay so if you were a knight you had land get into in a minute but basically you had land and you had people work under you okay you had servants and you also had a retinue so one night 10 people would usually be in the retinue okay these could be spearmen these could be experienced longbowmen these could be people that were men at arms that had good gear again that weren't that weren't actual knights okay but they would follow you okay and you would bring these people um to your lord whenever um, he called you up okay now what did knights do when they weren't fighting okay let's talk about this a little bit because knights weren't just sitting around doing nothing um, when they were not fighting, okay? Hunting, riding, tournaments, okay? Three major pillars of their, of, their, um, of their lifestyle, okay? Hunting was very much in the noble lifestyle, okay? Um, that's why <laughs> venison, right? And then on the king's land, you couldn't hunt if you were, you know, X, Y, and Z, not a noble, and they had rabbit warrens. There's a whole bunch of things you get it, you could get into about um, specific animals that were allowed to hunt. Okay, um, peasants weren't allowed to basically do shit besides you know get fish. Uh, nobles were allowed to hunt you know deer. And this is why the deer were preserved. Okay, hunting was a group sport. Basically, a whole bunch of nobles. I think basically a bunch of frat boys drinking and getting hunting bows and going to kill deer. Okay, and then it also got very more complex. It could even be turned into like a prestige thing. Okay. Hunting was very important for the nobility back then, okay? Riding, again, also very important. Tournaments, again, very important to show off their prowess and if they wanted to get advancement in certain positions. Again, it depends on the time, on the certain time period that this is happening because we're covering a lot of history here. Um, but knights sometimes performed in tournaments just for the ability to be on the king's guard, um, get some land, be recognized, a whole bunch of reasons they could go to tournaments, okay? They'd also learn how to, they'd be taking care of their horses, okay? Horses the knights were using, which were basically war horses and very prestigious riding horses, um, were very, very, very expensive. Think houses. Literal, your house today, that's how much it was about worth back then, okay? Um, so they didn't mess around when they were taking care of them, okay? They also had people to take care of them, obviously, but they would take care of them too because they needed to know how to do this. And they were trained from, because they were a squire, they should know how to do this. They'd also be managing land um, when they were there, okay? Um what does managing land entail, okay? For the men, if they were there, it would be being a local judge, okay? Be meeting out local disputes, you know? That person knocked down my fence, I want compensation, okay? Meet out fines and punishments. Rarely would they imprison people, okay? Usually a king would come down with the king's court and, you know, do that stuff, okay? But they could, in theory, if the crime was severe enough. Now, when the knight wasn't there and off campaigning, this is where the woman would man where his wife basically would manage the land okay they weren't powerless they were pretty powerful they would manage the land when he wasn't there which was depending on what time era we're talking about it could be as little as 40 days he was gone it could be longer again it's all up in the air um especially when you're talking about just generally medieval styles okay but when he wasn't there the woman would usually in our own timeline manage the land okay now let's talk about the chivalric code I mentioned the acolyte earlier, okay? So, on your screen right there is uh, the Code of Chivalry, kind of. It's whatever Code of Chivalry they wanted to make that day. But basically, what you're not supposed to do, or what you are supposed to do, is protect the weak and poor, honor women, never lie, show bravery, defend the church and the king, okay? Technically, this was supposed to ensure respect between knights, okay? Opposing knights generally were taken for ransom and could be expected to be treated well, okay? If you weren't a knight, this didn't apply to you, which is why they were usually kills or X, Y, and Z, okay? Because usually if you weren't a knight, your parents and family didn't have money to ransom you, so there's really no reason to keep you around and feed you. Um, but generally, that's how it was, okay? Battle of Agincourt is a little bit different. Henry killed a whole bunch of knights, except the very, very, very wealthy ones, so he could ransom them for a lot of money. Um, but generally, this is supposed to ensure respect between knights, okay? Generally. 
Also, these were just guidelines to follow, okay? There is a whole bigger list of stuff not to do that include beat priests, steal cows, hurt women, pyromancy, robbing, kidnapping, killing, harming the innocent. Not supposed to do those things. Again, guidelines to follow were the chivalric code. Again, not all knights did this. It really did. Some did whatever they wanted. Some followed these to the letter. The whole spectrum there, okay? Because you're talking about a whole class of people. But no, that it, this is what the survival code actually entails. Kind of. Generally. Next, we will talk about knightly orders in our own timeline, okay? So, we have the Knight's Hospitaller, the Knight's Templar, and the Teutonic Order. The Teutonic Order is uh, there, as you can see with the big wings on his helmet and the cross with the eagle, okay? Generally, that's how you know the Teutonic. So, these knightly orders, technically, you vowed poverty, forsake any personal and property, um, and wealth, okay, that you will ever have. So you forsake all personal property and your wealth, okay? Now, let's be very clear here. You couldn't just be Joe Schmuck and be a knight, okay, in these orders. That's not what happened, okay? You usually had to be from an upstanding family, usually from a knight family, and then join the order as a knight, okay, or a squire. Again, I don't have the full picture there, but that's generally how it happened. You don't join. There's a reason they're called sergeants, sergeants, which is the modern term, sergeants, sergeants, were basically peasants and everyone else, okay, that wasn't a knight in these orders, okay? Um, but technically, they don't have any wealth or property. Again, we're talking general here because the order does. It's like the Catholic Church today. The Catholic Church said they have, depending on what you say, no money, but they have money. Um, and they can buy stuff. That's why the Teutonic Order had a whole bunch of land and all that stuff, right? But generally, the people in them, the knights didn't have the money. It was an organization pot, okay? But generally, these knightly orders fulfill a purpose, okay? The Knights Hospitaller originally was just a hospital, okay? In the Holy Land, okay? Then they became defenders of uh, Christian pilgrims. The Knights Templars uh, basically formed to be um, protectors of pilgrims on the road to Jerusalem. The Teutonic Order um, was basically formed to basically go crusading in the Baltics and Christianize the people. That turned out rather well, uh, kind of, <laughs> depending on your perspective. Um, where they basically just fought a whole bunch of pagans and did whatever they wanted. Um, but yes. And again, this is just generally knightly orders. There are many more things you could do. Um, in D&D terms, you could make them for protecting a certain place, doing a certain thing, you know, doing whatever. Just know they generally had a purpose in behind them. And generally, knightly orders forsake any personal property and wealth, okay? If, because then if they're all brothers, they must share all of the stuff they have. Now... Not talking about specific uh, knightly orders, we're going to talk about royal knights, okay? So, by the 15th and 16th century, um, knights could be in an actual military unit that was loyal to the monarch, okay? This is very late. This is like when they have full plate armor and as best they're going to get, okay? Before guns really start taking off um, and then make them basically obsolete. Well, obsolete. I'll, I'll leave it there. There's a lot of stuff you could get into. But generally, guns did a number on these people. So, think actual professional military units that are actually loyal to the monarch because they get paid by them, okay? The gendarme, which are basically royal French knights, or gend gendarmerie is what I usually say, uh, basically were royal French knights that got paid by the king, okay? So, they're an actual military unit, and they would train together. Um, that's generally what we'll get into. Something knights didn't usually do was actually train together. Royal knights are a little bit different, okay? If they're actually a paid military unit by the king or the monarch or whoever... They could actually train together because that's basically their sole profession, okay? Uh, as we'll get into now, knights is a military unit that weren't royal knights um, and not in the uh, 15th and 16th century, okay? So usually knights were not, that dis were not disciplined as we think of it today, okay? We usually think, you know, you must keep eyes forward and, you know, trying to get attention and stuff. No. Uh, no, they weren't like that. So knights did not train together in a military unit regularly, usually ever. They rather just gathered around for their lord and they'd be put into a unit, okay? Like, you're now in this cavalry squadron, okay? Sometimes they would train when they were just standing around. Um, but they generally didn't go get a hundred knights together, practice in peacetime, and then, you know, disperse and keep doing that. They don't do that ever. Um, that's a modern, modern, way modern thing, okay? Um, at best, at the best you could do in our own timeline was 
get them together, maybe do some marching exercises um, once you're together in a unit, and then you're going to go off to fight the French. Um, sometimes they would initiate charges to seek glory and prestige. That's how they thought. That's how they saw it. If they could punch the enemy line and break their morale, they'd be the glory seekers and get prestige, okay? So sometimes Knight would charge into stupid situations and get themselves killed. Or, more usually, they would go, um, after they beat the enemy cavalry off, would go pillage the baggage train. Um, this lost a lot of battles because the baggage train is where all the loot is. And the knights would go loot it. And the actual battle would turn against the army that the knights were a part of. And they would lose because their cavalry fucked off and took the money. And didn't come back when they needed them most. Okay. Um, I can get into a whole separate issue on why they did that. But basically it was they weren't paid. Generally. They weren't paid a lot. So getting the baggage train first would give them a lot of money. Um, but sieges were especially brutal as knights took basically whatever they wanted. Um, they burned a town down. They'd go in your house. They could take whatever they wanted. They could kill you. Really do whatever they want. Um, again, generally... Uh, sieges, there's a wide variety of things. If the people surrendered immediately, they're probably not going to burn your stuff down. They may take some of your gold, some of your food, and leave you be. If you resist them for nine months, they may burn everything down and kill all of you and take all of your food and all of your money. Uh, again, it just generally depends on the time period and uh, um, how long the siege lasted. But more importantly is how long the siege lasted and how much you know um, suffering the knight had to go through. So, lastly, before we get to the armor in our own time, uh, armor in our own timeline, I can show you where uh, D and D is going to be. Um, let's talk about knights that are mounted versus knights that are dismounted. Okay, usually, generally, knights fought mounted. Okay, however, English knights fought dismounted. I don't think this is any big surprise to anybody. Okay, the best knights were the French. The best mounted knights, I will say, the best mounted knights were the French knights, bar none. You can fight me on that. Okay. They're the ones that got the gendarmes, okay? <laughs> they were the best, in my opinion. Um, they had... So, the reason there's two different sets... So, we'll get into it a little bit. N mountain knights versus dismounted knights, okay? So, there's a reason, usually, why country would focus on one or the other. And this was because if you're fighting mounted... You have to have a different armor configuration. You have different weapons and you have different tactics. Okay? Different armor configuration. Basically, you need a specific set of armor. Okay? And you need specific little parts. I can't really show you because I only have my face. But think little parts on your legs and different parts on your arms. Okay? For fighting mounted and against a lance charge. Okay? Because you need a lance and your armor is configured for you sitting down. Remember, this is important. It's for sitting down, protecting you as best as it can while you're sitting down in the lance charge, okay? Because you're charging with lances into whatever. Um, and that's your tactic is basically just, you know, charge into them with uh, big lances. Um, dismounted, again, you had different armor configurations. If you're standing versus sitting, you need armor that's a little bit, you know, more flexible, and you need to protect um, you standing when you're and not sitting, okay? They also had different weapons. You could have a halberd, you could have a poleaxe, okay? If you're dismounted versus on mount, you need a lance or an axe or a mace or whatever, okay? Different tactics. Um, you could fight in lines. There's a whole bunch of stuff you could do dismounted, okay? You could go through a forest way easier than you would on a horse and full armor, okay? So, just take a general note there that uh, the D&D &D knight is one that is dismounted, okay? And uh, we will be talking about knights, mounted knights and uh, dismounted knights in a little bit um, for their stat block. Um, but generally know that knights either fought mounted or dismounted, okay? That does not mean that they couldn't dismount and fight on foot. That happened plenty of times, okay? It's just that their armor and their weapons aren't configured to do so. So it's generally weaker when they do that, okay? But that's a little bit of the history between a mounted knight and a dismounted knight, okay? So now we're going to take a look into armor evolution, okay? So we went from chainmail to plate. It took many centuries to achieve, okay? In D&D, usually, depending on the time you're playing in, if you have guns, you're usually playing in the 16th or later centuries, okay, with the armor configurations. D&D doesn't... D&D has a lot of weird things going around it. 
Um, but yeah, 16th or maybe 15th century, depending on whatever. Okay. And I'm going to go through their armor evolution to show you at what point, if you want to set your D&D &D thing at whatever, um, where it's supposed to be technically, technologically in our timeline for their armor. Okay. So let's look. If you look on the right, you can see that basically this is, um, the evolution of armor. Okay. Generally from 1650 to 1675. Okay. So 650 to 1675. So. Uh, if we look, you can probably find my mouse cursor. This chainmail at 1250, okay? This is, so if you go back one more to the Normans, okay? In the 1100, 1150s, okay? They didn't have full leg coverage and they didn't have full arm coverage, okay? And they had the Norman style helmet, which is basically a, basically a pot and a brim here to protect your nose, okay? And your face from getting slashed. Now, this evolved into full chainmail, okay? Full chainmail everywhere, okay? We're talking full chainmail on the head. We're talking full chainmail on your on your hands and then all basically on your feet, okay? Um, and then you would wear the distinctive flat top, okay? And if you look down here from the 1100s to the 1250s, you can see flat top helmet, full chain, um, maybe had some shields because they both had shields um, and they have some little, uh, they're not really pauldrons, they're more just like identifying symbols, um, nothing plate. No, here's the important thing. There's no plate on them besides the helmet, okay? For uh, 1250, okay? So when you get a 1250, Templar helmet. What we think of as quote unquote Templar helmet is basically a flat top helmet, okay? Now, uh, the 1350s, okay, if you go to 1330 down here in the 1350s, we get to the transitional plate period, okay? So this is when we're starting to get transitional plates, okay? And I'm talking very generally here, okay? Because if you talk about 1300, um, they're starting to experiment with plates, plates on the elbows, plates on um, the knees, you know? And then it evolves into transitional plate, which basically a coat of plates, okay, that you could wear, uh, plated gauntlets, plated knee pads, um, and then plated helmet and plated shoulder pads, you know. Um, but basically what a coat of plate plates is, is basically think of a thing you can put on, like a vest, okay, like a modern day kind of plate carrier, and it holds plates, think of modern day plate carrier, except the plates are like that big and very long, and there's, <laughs> there's like a lot of them, uh, 30, 40. I don't have an actual coat of plates, so I can't really tell you, but usually 30 to 40 plates, you know, do, 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 everywhere, okay? Um, so not a actual breastplate, but just lines of actual plates, okay? And that's called a coat of plates. And they had some decent helmets, so they called them the sugar loaves, okay? You can have a sugar loaf helmet, which basically, instead of a flat top helmet, they figured out that if you have a flat top, you can get crushed very easily if they make it into a dome on the top of your head, you can deflect blows that come off, okay? So that's a sugar loaf helmet. Now, if we go past the 1350s and we go to the 1440s, okay? So we go to the 1400 here, okay? Now we have basically as much as you know full plate, okay? We still have chainmail around um, your waist, and we have chainmail aventail down here, and we have a pig-faced hel uh, pig helmet, okay? Uh, you could have a different variety of helmets now, but basically think you're getting very, very, very close to full plate armor, Okay. And if you go to 1440, you basically have full Gothic armor. Um, and then if you go to 1460, you know, even better armor, okay? So as you can see down here, by 1450, you could have frog mouths, you could have salad helmets, visors, armets, and they had the poleaxe now, okay? And just remember, before this, they technically were technically still using shields um, up to the 1400s, generally, because the plates weren't that good, and they were missing some coverage, okay? If you go to, like, 1380, they're technically still using shields, okay? But by 1450, they don't need shields. Um, unless they're in tournaments, we're not, we're, we're not going to talk about that. Um, generally, they don't need shields. And that's generally because their plate armor is good enough to basically block all the arrows and everything coming in. Um, that's how good plate got, okay? Now, we're going to take it a little step further. So, down here, it goes from 1450 to 1475. If we go up here, we can see there's a Maximilian era, okay? Which is basically just, it's something Maximilian means Emperor Maximilian and the Holy, Holy Roman Empire. Um, basically had a whole bunch of fluting and crap, okay? And I had uh, uh, basically the almost premium evolution of armor, okay? If you go all the way up to the 1580s, you can see that the plates are technically still getting better, okay? But the problem is by 1550, gunpowder is really starting to get kicked around, okay? And that stuff's really going through you, okay? Now, that does not mean that armor was made obsolete overnight, okay? The three-quarter suit, the suit right here, okay? And even the 1650 suit, okay? Uh, would actually stop pistol bullets if they were placed on your chest and you could fire. You can go check out the uh, Wallace Collection. They have a video that's very interesting by a um, historian that will talk about that, okay? But generally, this armor still technically worked. The reason they stopped using it was it was too goddamn expensive to to outfit a whole, you know, 
regiment um, or battalion or whatever. And it was a lot cheaper to just basically give them breastplate helmet. Go. Um, and that's where we get to the modern era. But we're not going to talk about that. But generally, no, we've covered everything. Okay, we've covered from like 1050. Okay, so 1100s all the way up to uh, 1525. And this is just the general evolution of the armor. Okay, so now we'll get into a little bit more detail. Okay, so the 12th century, 1100 to 1199. Okay, these were referred to as the Norman Knights. Usually, are usually what people would be referring to this style of armor as. Okay, they were the first true type of knights who emerged in the medieval ages, and they fought on horseback with spear and lance. Okay, think William the Conqueror. <laughs> um, era basically and norman norman d norman norman d okay so as you can see here this knight has basically full chainmail hauberk he doesn't have the full sleeves his legs are exposed okay he doesn't have a full doesn't have a real helmet um his helmet is down here it's a conical shape that will protect his uh, nose and face um and an avantail or kind of avantail thing that you can pull up okay but that's the 12th century just think chainmail and pretty good chainmail Okay, but not full coverage. 13th century, okay? In the 13th century, we're talking full, full, um, full male, basically. Full male hauberk. Um, you could have full male mittens. You could have full male whatever you want, really. 1200 to 1299, okay? These are the Crusaders. Uh, we would generally refer to them. Um, technically, um, 1199, uh, basically, I think this is like the prime era um, before <laughs> the fall of Jerusalem, technically, okay? So, that's generally what they are referred to as. So, they're known for their flat tops, okay? The flat top helmet and the sugar loaf, okay? Which is basically a pointed helmet up here, okay? Um, they had a male hauberk that covered mostly, as again, as I've said, everything. And they had mail everywhere they wanted it. They still used a shield and they used a sword at this time, okay? Next, the 14th century, okay? So, the 14th century is... This is where we start getting coats of plates, okay? Coats of plates were introduced, as I talked about, basically a series of plates and a vest that you could wear. And this evolved into plate armor. As you can see here, we have a skull face helmet or a pig face helmet. Um, and then you have, you know, plates basically everywhere with, an app, with a chain mail um, under, and then you had a gambus under that. And, you know, it just keeps evolving 14, 1340 to 1460 and keeps evolving, okay, into eventual plate armor. 15th century, we're talking 1400s to 1499, okay? This is the Battle of Agincourt. Full plate armor was in swing, gothic styles of armor versus Italian style armor, okay? So the gothic style of armor is the one you see there, okay? It's got a whole bunch of fluting, which basically makes it really nice, okay? If I was going to wear some armor and buy some armor, it'd be gothic, okay? There is an additional different style, technically in our historical timeline, of Italian style armor, okay? And it's basically just flat, more or less. And they had a big leather strap to you know, keep the breastplate and the lower breastplate together. Um, but we're not really going to get into that, because that's more of an actual history thing. Okay, but there were two styles of armor. In the 16th century, uh, 1500 to 1599, last time generally knight, generally knights found, uh, fought mounted, okay, because due to basically pikes, uh, guns and pikes, okay, which will transition into the 17th century, which is basically the pike and shot era, and also the 16th century, which basically became the pike and shot era. Absolutely the best plate you could ever get was in this era, even, uh, even at some ranges, um, depending what the pistol was, what the armor was, you could stop a pistol bullet at point blank range um again it just depends but generally this is the pinnacle set of armor okay so well, we've covered all of that okay we've covered the entire history and the historical precedence um of knights okay so now where does this come into D, D? okay very simply we will make stat blocks to base the knights on okay so generally as we've talked about our entire history you can play with it wherever you want, okay? But I've covered everything you absolutely need to know about our own history, and you can take it into a D&D &D history, and now you understand why knights were, and squires were, a lot better than a CR3 creature. So now we're going to get into their stat blocks that you can go use, okay? Now, before I talk about all of this stuff, um, all of these are on my Patreon, because I'm only going to show you two. That's how uh, it is, okay? So I'll show you the squire, and I'll show you one knight stat block. The rest of them are going to be on my Patreon. But... The squire, okay? So he's gonna wear splint. He's not gonna wear plate because it's just probably can't afford it, okay? He has 100 HP, which might seem low to you guys, um, but it's generally okay. Um, he's only a CR5 creature, which is pretty good for 100 HP. There's a whole bunch of stats you can read there. He's half proficient in everything because he is learning, as I've said. Um, he has dark vision and passive perception. You can take them out, you can play with them. 
however you wish, okay? But the thing to note is he has three melee attacks, long sword, and a dagger, okay? In case he loses his long sword, he can switch back to his dagger, okay? Um, but that's generally how a squire stat block will go, okay? Next is the foot knight, okay? This is the D&D &D thing that we were trying to solve in this video, which was if we look all the way back to the beginning of the video, it's basically the knight. And this is the equivalent um, in D&D &D using all, all that we have learned today, okay? So, the foot knight has plate armor, 150 HP. Pretty good. You got 20 strength and 20 con. Okay. He's proficient in strength and con and charisma saving throws. Okay. Because he, fun fact, knights were very affluent and talked with a lot of people. As you can see, he has expertise in athletics and um, animal handling because they had to be good at something, right? Those are the two things they're absolutely good at. They're proficient in a whole bunch of other stuff. They got dark vision, professor perception. Okay. But let's talk about some of their special abilities. Second chance. Okay. The knight's not yet done. Uh, they have one more chance to beat the enemy on the knight's turn. The knight can use their bonus action and get 50 HP back. Basically, it gives them a little health boost, okay? Um, and they can't use it again for a short or long rest. Zone defender, okay? So we're talking about a foot knight here. So usually foot knights had a pole axe or a halberd or whatever, um, but generally a pole arm, okay? So zone defender basically will stop um, an enemy if they come. If you basically hit an attack, the creature um, drops to zero until the end of the current turn while they're within reach creature moves within reach basically if they move in you can hit them and you stop them okay sword master basically it adds a plus two chance to hit on all your melee attacks it's basically archery technically but a different version that i made for melee attacks okay um so yes it gives them a very high chance to hit because they have been training their entire lives for this okay they have multi-attack they get four attacks halberd longsword dagger Okay? These are three weapons that <laughs> if they get knocked out of their hand, so for example, if a player is a battle master and they knock the halberd out of their hand, they can draw their sword. If that somehow gets knocked out of their hand, they can draw their dagger. <laughs> okay, This gives them options. That's generally how well these guys were armed. Okay, um, And also the reaction. They have a reaction which basically adds a... Uh, they can parry. So if, they, if an attack comes in, they can technically parry with, a, with their pole arm or however you want to roll it. Okay? They can add a 4 to their AC for one melee attack that would hit, and the knights must see the attacker and be wielding a melee weapon, which they all are. You will now notice that they do not have ranged weapons, okay? I did this consciously. In our own timeline, they didn't have ranged weapons. It's too much stuff to carry for them, okay? Um, and they generally just fought melee, okay? Um, if you want to give them whatever, go ahead and do so, okay? That's up to you. So... That will be the conclusion of this video. Again, I have a whole bunch more sets of different stat blocks you can do for knights. I have foot knights. I have foot knights with great swords. I have mounted knights, which you don't see here. I have stat blocks for all of them. I have the elite versions, which are even better than these guys, okay? That are all going to be on my Patreon, okay? Also, again, I'm going to have maps up there. There's a whole bunch of stuff up there. The squad combat module, maps, everything is up there. Um, if you will be kind enough to support me, you also get access to this and, you know, everything else up there. Today we've covered the knights, we've covered their history, we've covered everything that you would need to know about our own history about knights to incorporate into your D&D um, setting, okay, or whatever you wanted to use it. And we've also made the knights better, in my opinion, for D&D. &D. So, if you like this video, go ahead and leave a like up there, okay, it really helps this channel out. Also, on your screen up there should take you um, to a different video for D&D, &D. that should be uh, my th uh, third level spell that you can go see um, if you would like. Otherwise, if you like this video, again, leave a like. Otherwise, I'll have a good day, and I will see you people next time.